Well, before I go any further, two things I have to say. One, this message is not mine. Of course, really no message is mine. They're all given to every pastor by the Lord. But 99% of this material I'm going to share with you um, is what I received from a seminar I went to a few weeks back um, by a gentleman named Dr. Michael Brown. And um, he did a study on healing. And it was, I've been studying that for many, many years. And um, he just presented some things that I never thought of and just a different way of looking at it. So I wanted to share that with you. But the other thing I wanted to say before I get started is, you know what? It's sad. You, you can see the devil's fingerprints all over it. But you know churches have been split over your viewpoint of healing? Denominations have been started. Some denominations say, nope, the gift of healing ended with the last apostle. And others say, oh, no, you gotta, you got to dip, you got to dunk, you got to scream, you got to roll, you got to say this, all these different formulas. And it's sad. Because does anybody here want to be sick? No. Does anybody here want people you know, friends or family, to be sick? No. So we're all in the same boat together. So it's just the old devil's divide and conquer. Why can't we just, even if we may not agree on every jot and tittle, the goal is we want to be healthy. We want our, our friends and family to be healthy. And I believe God wants us to be healthy. So let's, let's be in this together and, and pull for each other and not make it a, a, a battle of contention. Oh, well, you didn't say it exactly this way. You don't believe exactly that scripture the way I do. You know what? We all believe God's word is God's word. And we want what's best for each one of us. And we want what's in the will of God. So... Let's just relax and just agree. And let's just listen as I share some of these things with you. The first thing that was brought out is, you know how God deals with mankind differently throughout history? The dispensations. First of all, there's the dispensation of innocence in the garden with Adam and Eve. Then there was the dispensation of conscience. Well, then man could, you know sear his conscience. Then there was the dispensation of the law. And now we're living in the dispensation of grace. God is the same. He changes not. But his way of dealing with mankind has changed throughout history. Well, in this realm of healing and sickness and illness, God, he's never changed. He's never changed his, his uh, modus operandi. But things are approached from different manners. So first of all, because Jesus said the Bible's divided up into the law, the prophets, and then when he was here, the New Testament. And those are the three areas that I want to talk about. Now the first one's called the Sinai Covenant. And it was given in the Old Testament during the law. And the first thing we have to realize is that sickness and illness and disease in itself is bad. It's never good. It's never what God wants. Now, God can work with people through illnesses, but it's never what he wants. So, he gives us a format here in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. He said this, And said, If thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now that tells us a number of things. First of all, God wants us to be diligent, to listen to him, to obey him, and to know his commandments and follow them. And if we do that, he said he won't put any plagues or diseases on us like he did put on Egypt. So that means God did put diseases and plagues on Egypt. Remember when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, hey, let my people go. And he said, nope, ain't going to do it. Well, guess what? He did. But it took plagues and illnesses. When all the cattle died and the frogs came up and all the lice and the flies and all kinds of diseases was, was started. 
And God says, but I will never do that to you if you follow my commandments and you obey me. And he says, because I am the Lord that healeth thee. That is God's nature. He's a healing God. In Exodus 23 and verse 25, it says, And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. That's God. He wants to keep his people healthy. He wants to take sickness away from us. Now, that doesn't mean that if someone is sick, that they're living in sin. But it does mean, according to this, the Sinai Covenant, that if you lived in sin, you were going to be sick. But not everybody that's sick is living in sin. We'll talk more about it later, but the perfect example is Job. Job did nothing wrong, but he had all these calamities come upon him. Healing and forgiveness go hand in hand. In Psalm 103, verses 2 through 3, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Anybody here ever gone for a job interview? Well, when you go for a job interview, and after you finally get offered the job and they tell you what your salary is going to be, What's the next thing you ask? Well, what kind of benefits do you offer? Do you have insurance, 401k? Do you have paid vacations? You're not going to leave that meeting until you know what the benefits are. And God's saying to us, you know what? I want you to remember what my benefits are. Well, what are the benefits? First of all, he forgives all of our iniquities. Does anybody doubt that? That if you come to God and you ask him to forgive you, that he'll forgive you of your sins and your iniquities? Does anybody doubt that? Well, some people have a hard time believing that God could forgive them. Oh, you don't know what I've done. It's been so bad. Rest assured, First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. You ask him to forgive you, he will. He forgives you of all your iniquities. Well, the next benefit is he heals us of all our diseases. Not some, but all of our diseases. Those are the benefits. And he's saying, don't forget those. God, wants, God is in the healing business, and he wants to heal his people. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 and 22, it says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let there not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. If you know God's word and you know God and you're living in his word, you'll live a healthier life. You know, before I was a Christian, I, if you could get it to burn, I'd smoke it. If you could put it in a glass, I'd drink it. I mean, I would, I would do anything. I didn't care. Ate whatever I wanted, did whatever I wanted, and I was not a very healthy person. But when you just automatically, when you become a Christian, you start following God's word, all of a sudden, you don't do those harmful things anymore. And it's health to your flesh. It's health to you. Now, in the prophetic books, there's a lot of healing scriptures, and I don't have time to go through all these. And I just want to focus on some of the ones that he, he mentioned um, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. It says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel with anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more, the whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. The people of Israel, even though they're serving a God who's a good God, who loves them, who wants to keep them healthy, they rebelled against him, and they fell into grievous sins and grievous illnesses. And they were very sick, and their hearts were faint. But in the midst of all that, Isaiah 53, 5 it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. 
Now, the interesting thing about that scripture, that's Old Testament prophesying of what's going to happen hundreds of years later when Jesus comes to earth. Now, those of you that were here for Good Friday and you saw the passion of the Christ and you saw what Jesus went through, you know, God controlled every aspect of all that. And you think, oh, that was horrendous. God the Father allowed all that to take place. He prophesied that not one bone in, in Jesus' body would be broken. Yeah, but the, the, the soldiers, they punched him in the face and they broke his nose. Yeah, but the nose is not a bone, it's cartilage. Not one bone in his body was broken, even though he was severely beaten and bruised like that. You know, when, a, when an average thief was going to be crucified, they didn't go through a scourging like that. They actually wanted to nail him to that tree as healthy as possible because they wanted the, the punishment to extend as long as possible. They wanted to make some people nailed to a cross would stay on there for, for weeks, you know, because they, they were healthy and it took that long for them to die. But with Jesus, two things. God the Father allowed his son to go through that. One, one reason was Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream and said, I had a dream that an innocent man's going to be brought before you tomorrow. Have nothing to do with him. And so Pilate was afraid. He didn't want to crucify Jesus. So he thought, if I just give him a good beating, then that will satisfy the Jews and they'll leave him alone. But as we know, it didn't. But the reason that God the Father allowed his son to go through that, why? Because God's a masochist? No. It's because of those stripes he provided healing. Remember what Proverbs 103 said? The benefits, he forgives our sins. That took place on the cross. And he heals us of our diseases. That took place with the whipping on his back. The stripes provided that healing. Physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing. That's why God the Father allowed his son to be beaten like that. It wasn't just because he's a masochist, and that wasn't the normal way for a person to be crucified. But there was a purpose for it. And Isaiah prophesied of that many years before that took place. Well, in Jeremiah, another prophet, chapter 30, verses 12 through 13, it says, For thus saith the Lord, Thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. The children of Israel were so rebellious in following all the other pagan gods around them that God just gave them up to that and said, okay, if that's the way you want to go, and it led to sickness and illness. And even when they went to for the different doctors for healing medicines, it didn't do them any good. Because they were totally in rebellion against God. But once they did repent, in Jeremiah 30, verse 17, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. When Israel was rebelling against God, all the rest of the world says, I don't want nothing to do with them. I don't want, they're outcasts. There's no help for them. But when they repented and they came back to God, he healed them. Now, in the New Testament, we're stepping in a whole new area of how God deals with us human beings in the realm of healing. And what Jesus did was very unique. All the Old Testament, the Sinai Covenant and the prophetic books, we're always looking forward to what Jesus was going to do. Well, now he's here. And wherever Jesus goes, the kingdom goes. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. 
the fame of Jesus, people came from all over and he healed them all no matter what their illness was. Because where Jesus goes, the kingdom goes. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. These are just normal human beings like you and I, and Jesus gave them power. And what did they do? They just proclaimed that the kingdom is here. Remember how Jesus taught us to pray? When the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, in God's kingdom, is anybody sick? Is anybody sinning? Is anybody in torment? Is anybody demon-possessed in heaven? No. So what Jesus was doing is just proclaiming the kingdom is here. Remember he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. I'm here, so the kingdom is here. And that's all he was doing, is telling his disciples, go wherever you can and proclaim that the kingdom is here. And in God's kingdom, people are healed. People are delivered. When you proclaim God's kingdom, guess what? Devils can't stand it. They can't hang around. Now, in um, the scripture I just read in Matthew, he gave them power against unclean spirits because demons can make people sick. In Matthew twelve twenty two, there was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. Now, that doesn't mean everyone who's blind is demon-possessed. And everyone who can't talk is demon-possessed. But demons can make people sick. You know, the psychic healers that you hear about? Um, excellent book I highly recommend called The Beautiful Side of Evil by Joanna Michelson. And these psychic healers, she used to heal people in the name of Jesus. Because she had a picture of Jesus on the wall and she didn't know him but she would heal these people and these are the ones that they stick their hands in your body and pull out diseased organs well a lot of it is a magic trick but if the devil sees somebody walking around and he just wants to inflict them with something and then if Satan is transformed as an angel of light so are his ministers transformed as ministers of righteousness the devil will get one of his ministers like what Joanna Michelson used to be and say go heal that person and say, in the name of Jesus, I heal you. Well, the devil just took off the affliction he put on that person. And then everybody says, ooh, wow, these psychic healers, they can really heal. No, it's just a magic trick. And it's a big spiritual counterfeit. But devils can make people sick. You know, one thing that Michael Brown said I thought was very interesting. Whenever you pray with somebody about healing, and you say, Lord, if it be thy will, heal Brother McGillicuddy. When you say that, and then the person doesn't get healed, what do you do then? Well, you send Brother McGillicuddy to go to the doctor. So are you saying the doctor can do something that God can't? Or if you're saying God doesn't want him to be healed because you prayed if it's your will, heal him and he doesn't get healed. So then you're going to the doctor and you're asking the doctor to go against God's will. Now, I told you the story before about um, Brother Shambach was preaching at, this, uh, at some revival once, and this woman came up to him and says, Oh, Brother Shambach, please pray for me. The Lord's given me cancer so he can make me humble. And he says, Okay, sister, I'll pray for you. And he put his hand on her head, and he says, Oh, dear Lord, give this sister more cancer. And she jumped back, What are you doing? And he says, Well, God, you said God gave you cancer to make you humble don't you want to be more humble let's get you more cancer and she said that's ridiculous and he says yeah i know it is god's not going to give you cancer to make you more humble but that's what we think sometimes so if you're saying lord if it be your will it's always god's will that you're healed always jesus gave his disciples power over demons and to preach the kingdom in Luke 9, verses 1 through 2, Then he called his disciples, his twelve disciples together, and gave them power and authority over all the devils, 
and to cure diseases. Now, how are they going to have power over all the devils? And how are they going to cure these diseases? Because he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. All you got to do is preach the kingdom is here. I've come into this building sometimes at night when there's nobody here. And this room that you're sitting in right now is pitch black. And when I want to be able to see what I'm doing, I have Bobette open that door over there, and I get a broom, and I sweep all the darkness out of the room. <laughs> and then I turn on the light. Is that what I do? No. All I do is I go over there and see that little switch on the wall there? I just go flick, and all of a sudden the lights come on, and it's bright in here. The Apostle Paul said, darkness is consumed by the light. You turn on the light, and the darkness goes away. You'll never be in a room that's dark and light at the same time. It can't. It's the same thing. When Jesus shows up and says, the kingdom is here, in God's kingdom, there's no sickness. There's no demons. There's no oppression. In Luke 13, verses 11 through 13, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And when he had laid his hands on her, immediately she was made straight, and glorified God. You notice what Jesus did there? Well, I started at verse 11. In verse 10 it says, But before this happened, he enrolled her into a two-week seminar on how to be healed. (laughs) And then he taught her on how to make a positive confession and how to have the right amount of faith. Is that what it did? No, this woman's just walking along, minding her own business. And Jesus says, Come here, the kingdom is here, because I'm here. And all he did is he laid his hands on her. He didn't roll around. He didn't bark like a dog. He didn't make it rain gold dust. He just said, the kingdom of God is here. And he says, you know what? You're infirmity. You're loosed. And she was healed, and she glorified God. And that's all we got to do. You know, wherever the devil is, there's three things. There's darkness, there's sickness, and there's evil. Wherever Jesus is, you know where there is? There's three things. There's light, there's healing, and there's goodness. So when we show up, being a Christian, you got the Holy Spirit living inside you. Wherever, you. wherever Jesus goes, the kingdom goes. Wherever I go, wherever you go, the kingdom is there. All we got to do is proclaim it. The kingdom is here. In God's kingdom, nobody's sick. Nobody's demon-possessed. Nobody is afflicted. Well, then why are people still sick? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, I love this verse. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Ooh, wow, doesn't that sound great? God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And what did he do with all that? He just went about doing good. That's what he did with all this. This is Jesus, the Word made flesh, and God Almighty gave him all this Holy Ghost power. And what's he do? He just goes around doing good. And what did he do with that good? He healed all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, because the kingdom is in him. And that's all Jesus did, and that's all he wants us to do. All we need to do is preach the kingdom. In Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8, He said, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received this, and freely give. You didn't get this power because there's anything special about you, or there's anything special about me. It's because there's everything special about him. So it was given to us freely. Don't be stingy. Everywhere you go, say, can I, someone said, can I pray with you? In the name of Jesus, you're healed because the kingdom is is here. Yeah, but what if he doesn't get healed? We'll talk about that in a moment. Jesus is the kingdom incarnate. In Romans 14, 7, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, 
but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with the kingdom. And the kingdom is inside of each one of us. In John 1.14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is God Almighty, wrapped in flesh. And then in John fourteen twelve, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, there's a lot of debates. Well, what more can we do? What's greater than what Jesus did? He raised the dead, cast out devils, healed lepers, the multitudes. He healed them all. How could, how could you do anything greater than that? Well, what this, this speaker, Michael Brown, said, he says, you know what? We can spend our time debating on what the greater works are. He says, why don't we just concentrate on doing the same works that Jesus did? That would be pretty good too, wouldn't it? But one thing that he offered, and I've, this is how I interpret this scripture, is greater works doesn't mean in magnificence, but it means in volume. Because Jesus, when he was here, he was one person in one place at one time. And he says, I'm going to my Father. And it's actually better for you that I do. Because when I go, I'm going to have him send the Comforter. And the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at once. He had mentioned how some study was given. I, I forgot who the source was of this study that took place. But over 200 million people worldwide claim to have either experienced a miracle themselves or seen a miracle take place. 200 million in the world today. So it's not like God's not doing miracles. So we can't say, well, why doesn't God heal? He is. Maybe not the way we think or the way we have seen or experienced, but God has, let me ask you, just in this room, has anyone here ever prayed and been healed of something? Well, there you go. Don't say God doesn't heal today. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. That power has been given to each one of us. And that power is to just simply go around and say, The kingdom is here. You can be healed in God's kingdom. There's nothing but light, healing, and goodness. What did Jesus do when he was filled with the Holy Ghost and power? He just went about doing good. You know, so many times we're afraid when we come across somebody and they're not, they're not feeling well or there's some kind of infirmity, and we say, I don't want to go and ask them if I can pray for them because what if they don't get healed right away? I'm going to end up looking like an idiot. Well, that ain't your responsibility. The sower of the seed doesn't walk around and say, ooh, this seed's really precious. I better make sure, okay, here's some good ground, and I'll put one over here. Oh, that's rocky ground. I don't want to put it there. Oh, there's thorny ground. No, he just threw the seed everywhere. And all we're supposed to do is everywhere we go proclaim, the kingdom is here. Because Jesus has come, he's risen from the dead, he lives inside me, and the kingdom is here. And in God's kingdom, there's nothing but light, healing, and goodness. So let's pray and ask him to heal you. Is it his will? It's always his will. Yeah, but what if they don't get healed? I'll talk about that in a minute. I told you. I'm getting there. Because we all have that question. In James chapter 5 and verse 14. Is there any sick among you? Well, then let them go to Blue Cross and Blue Shield and get a PPO and get the right re uh, reference sheet and then go to the hospital down the street. Is that what it says? It says, call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him and anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And it says, the prayer of the faith will save the sick. Now that word save, well, what if they're already saved? But that word saved in the Hebrew, or I'm sorry, in the Greek means, it's the word sozo. And it means to restore and to make whole physically, emotionally, spiritually. So, all right, Jake, would you stand up? Gary, would you stand up? 
Ken, would you stand up? And I'm standing up. You got right here four spiritual doctors. I always think you can sit down now. You look funny standing there. <laughs> I always think it's amazing when people call, oh, Pastor Dave, I wanted to come to church yesterday, but I was sick. Well, this is the first place you should come. But I went to the doctor. Now, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, but you know what? The first place you should come is if you're sick, come to church and we'll anoint you with oil and we'll pray for you. Yeah, well, what if I don't get healed right away? We'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> There's no simple formula. Like some people say, oh, you got to stand on one foot and you got to put your head right here. You don't put your hand... Your hand here, don't put it here. It's got to be right here. You got to have, I've heard people say you got to have the right mixture of anointing oil <coughs> or it doesn't work. <clears throat> well, then it's the oil that's healing people. Some people say, oh, you got to be anointed. Or only certain people have the gift of healing. Well, you know what? I don't argue with people if I have the gift of healing or not because I know somebody who does. His name is Jesus. And I just ask Jesus to heal him. I'm not going to heal him. So I've never turned anyone out. Oh, I can't pray for you, brother. I don't have the gift of healing. I wish Sister McGillicuddy was here. She, she's got that anointing. She could pray for you. No, it's not Sister McGillicuddy that's healing you. It's Jesus. And his kingdom lives in me as much as it does anybody else. So there's no magic formula. What did Jesus do to that woman with the infirmity? He said, I'm here. The kingdom's here. He laid hands on her. He said, you're infirm and he's gone. In the name, well, he didn't say in the name of Jesus, but we do because we've been given that authority. In the name of Jesus, you're healed. But what happens if they don't get healed? We'll get to that in a moment. One of the questions that I asked him was, what about, what's the difference when Jesus saw the multitudes they were all sick, and he healed every single one of them. Now, in a multitude, there's a variety of levels of faith, variety of levels of uh, understanding of God's word, variety of levels of obedience to God's word, but he healed every single one of them. You know, we're all hung up on this, oh, you've got to have enough faith. Well, how much is enough faith? Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed which is the smallest seed in the vegetable kingdom, from what I've been told, you can say to that mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea. Do you have enough, did you have enough faith to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Well, then you got enough faith to be healed. So when people say, Oh, you just don't have enough faith. We'll get to that in a moment. That's another excuse that is used. But these people... The multitude, Jesus healed them all. But then when he went to his own hometown, it said he didn't do many miracles because of their lack of faith. Well, did the people in his town have less faith than the, the multitudes everywhere he went? And the way he described it, which I thought was very good, was he said that the multitudes, the people came to him. And just by coming to him, that's enough faith. Just by, Jesus said, if any man comes unto me, I will no wise cast him out. Just by you coming to him, or you coming to one of the elders to be prayed for, that's enough faith for God to honor. The people in Jesus' hometown, they didn't come to him. Because the people in the multitudes, they said, oh, we believe this man could heal us. He's healed others. But the people in his hometown said, give me a break. That's Jesus. I went to high school with him. His, his dad, Joseph, used to build tables for me. I grew up with him. We used to play baseball around the corner. I, Jesus is going to heal me? Get out of here. They didn't even come to him for healing because they didn't believe he could. So the difference was that these people came to Jesus where the people in his hometown didn't. And he wasn't going to heal. He's not going to force himself on anybody. Now here's a big one. <clears throat> Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So, this has been interpreted in many different ways, and before I go any further, I have to do a little 
precursor here. I have to do a little bit of explanation. When I um, was a, a young Christian, I got very involved in the faith movement, the hyper-faith movement. And um, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Seville, Jesse Duplantis, Charles Capps, all those guys read all their books, bought all their tapes. Every time they were in town, I went to see them. And you know what? 99% of what they say is right on. Hallelujah. It's the word of God. But some things were just taken out of, I believe, the proper biblical explanation. And this is one of them. Why people don't get healed. Because you're not making a positive confession. So let's break this down literally. If death and life are in the power of the tongue, that means, you know what heals me? My tongue. I don't need Jesus. Just, hey Dave, you're a millionaire and you got everything you want and you're healed and everything's perfect. No problems in your life. And I just keep saying that and my tongue makes everything perfect. It also says, and they love it. And they that love it, eat the fruit of it. What if I don't love it? Then I don't eat the fruit of it? So the tongue has all this power only if I believe it does. But if I don't believe it has all this tongue, I don't have to worry about it. But the problem is, that is talking about a principle. And the principle is, God doesn't want us walking around saying, Oh, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms. Nothing in my life ever goes good. Because you know what happens? When you, when you say those things, you're sowing a thought. And that thought reaps an action. And then you live that lifestyle. He's giving us a principle. Like I heard the story, one of the saddest stories I ever heard, of a man, um, he was on the 700 Club many years ago. And he said when he was a little boy, his dad was a hardened criminal. And he put him in the car and he drove him to the state penitentiary down the road. And they got out of the car and they both looked through the bars. And he said, kid, that's where you're going to end up someday. You're going to be like your old man. You're never going to amount to anything. And you know what? His son took those words to heart. And he started living out that lifestyle. And guess what? He ended up in prison. Now there was a young man by the name of John Wesley. His mother godly woman every time when she put him to bed at night she would pray over him and she would say to him you are a mighty man of god god is going to use you for great things you're going to change this world and he was became john wesley and he was a mighty man of god and god used him to change the world but because he took that to heart and he started living in that so it's not like every single word that comes out of your mouth is going to either Oh, God loves me. Oh, God hates me. Well, which one is it? Does God love you or hate you? God's going to bless me. Oh, God's going to curse me. Well, which one is it? God's up there going, I don't know what to do with this kid. See, if we take it that literally, and I'm not ever saying don't take the word literally, but if we take it that literally, what happens is we walk around in fear. And Paul told Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So Jesus never said to any of these people in the multitude, he says, now you make sure that I've healed you, okay? Now you make sure you keep saying that positive confession or you're going to lose your healing. He never said that. What he did say is go to the priest and show yourself because the priest back in those days were the equivalent of the doctor. Because I've heard people say, Oh, if you get prayed for and, and you don't see the manifestation of it, if you go to the doctor, that's a lack of faith and you're going to lose your healing. Jesus said the exact opposite. Go to the doctor and show him because if you've been healed, it'll show up on the screen. There's a woman that came to our church and she was going in the very next day to have a, um, a biopsy on this lump in her breast because it showed up in the mammogram. She came forward, anointed her with oil, laid my hands on her, prayed with her, and then the next day, she went to the doctor, and the doctor says, I don't understand it. There's nothing there. The lump is gone. Now, she went to the doctor. Was she losing her healing by even going there? No, the doctor verified if God heals you, it'll show up on a test. It'll show up on a screen. You don't have to worry about losing it because, oh, I made a negative confession. Now, yeah, like I said, we are not supposed to walk around and say, oh, nothing ever works good for me. God doesn't love me. Look at them. He loves them. No, he's not saying that. 
but not to walk around and, uh oh, if I say the wrong thing, the devil's going to jump on me. Perfect example is Job. <clears throat> I could preach a whole sermon on Job, but I don't have time. Now I'm going to take over for Dr. Mark Michael Brown, and I'm going a little bit on my own here, but what I've learned in this whole thing, because I was bound by that, making a negative confession, and I always had to be positive. I could be standing there, and my nose would be dripping so that the snot was bouncing off my shoes. And if somebody I had a cold, I'd say, nope, I don't have a cold. Nope, because as soon as if I said I had a cold, I'd get a cold. Well, guess what? I already had a cold. Why not just say, yeah, I got a cold, but God's going to heal me of the cold. But I was so bound up with this. But look at Job. Satan shows up with all the other angels, and God says to him, what are you doing here? Where have you been? What, you think God didn't know where, where Job was, or where Satan was? And he says, well, I've been roaming to and fro around the earth, trying to stir up trouble. God knew that. And some people say, well, see, what happened to Job is because he said, the thing that I feared has come upon me. Well, Job wasn't walking around every day saying, oh, I'm afraid God's going to kill all my kids and, st and kill all my cattle and make my house burn down. He never said that. It was just something in his heart that he says, I, God's blessed me. I don't ever want to lose it. But God taught him something. But what, what, he, what God says to Satan is he says, have you considered my servant Job? Job's minding his own business, and God goes and puts a bullseye on Job's back. Satan wasn't even talking about Job. If all this happened to Job because the thing that he feared came upon him, Satan would be ready to pounce on him. But he wasn't even thinking about it. As a matter of fact, when God said, have you considered my servant Job? Well, Satan says, yeah, I know him. And he loves you and he praises you because you gave him everything he ever wanted. If you take it away, he'll curse you. And God says, well, take it away. And Satan says, I can't. Because you put a hedge of protection around him. Guess what? God has a hedge of protection around you. I believe God even has a hedge of protection around the unsaved. Because if he didn't, Satan would just send a bunch of demons down to the hospital and every time a baby's born a demon would jump in and possess that kid from birth and they would live their whole life demonized there's a hedge of protection around god's grace around everybody now satan we can tear down that and step out of that will and put ourselves in harm's way but god has a hedge of protection around him and it says in job 122 in all this job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. So, yes, we are supposed to speak the word of God and proclaim his kingdom and not walk around, woe is me, nothing good ever happens to me. But if you're having a bad day or if someone prays for you and you don't say exactly the right thing, it's not like the devil can come in and steal something from you. Paul said, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. If God blesses me with a healing, the world can't take it away, and the devil can't. I'm not walking around afraid of the devil. You know, you can make a positive confession all day long, but if you ain't living the life and walking the walk, it ain't going to do you any good. I hate to mention names, but it, it's applicable here. Back in the 80s, there was a man by the name of... Uh, John Wesley Fletcher. I used to love this guy. Great preacher. He was a great healing, had a healing ministry. Many people were healed by him. But, and he was making positive confessions all day long. That's what he preached all the time. But you know what was going on in his life? His babysitter was a woman named Jessica Hahn. Remember her? And he was sleeping with her on the side when his wife wasn't there. Well, he was on PTL all the time, and he would go up there and preach up a storm and lay hands on people, and they all got healed. And when Pat or uh, Tammy Faye started to going out with the guy who wrote the Monster Mash, and so John Wesley Fletcher said to Jim Baker, "Hey, she's sneaking around. Why don't you come on over? And I'll introduce you to my my babysitter, Jessica." And one day, Jim Baker took him up on it, and he slept with her. That was the beginning of his demise. But here's a guy making positive confessions, preaching the word of God, laying hands on people and they got healed. But what's happening in his life? 
John Wesley Fletcher later died from AIDS. So positive confessions are great, but it don't amount to a hill of beans if you ain't living it. It says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When, when um, <clears throat> Elijah stood against the 400 prophets of Baal, they whooped and jumped and hollered and screamed and nothing happened. But Elijah said, Lord, send down the fire. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Yeah, we're supposed to have positive confessions and we're supposed to speak the word of God and be a believing people. But if you're having a bad day or you don't say exactly the right thing, don't worry, oh, the devil's going to come get me. I never worry about what the devil's going to do to me because I know what he wants to do to me. John 10.10 10 says he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Every day I wake up, he says, there's that David Michael guy. I want to steal everything he's got. I want to kill him dead, and I want to destroy even the reputation of him. I know that. But there's a second part of that scripture. Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. That's what I'm leaning on. I never worry about what the devil's doing to me, and I'm not going to. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear. So, the other thing that Michael Brown did say is his statement, not mine, but it's pretty interesting. He said, actually, more people in this world are healed through a proper diet than they are by a prayer for healing. Why aren't people healthier? Why are people sick today? What if I called you over my house and said, Oh, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, please come over and pray for me. I'm in the worst pain of my whole life. Please come. And you come over. Oh, yeah, I'll be there, Pastor Dave. I'll pray for you. I'll bring the anointing oil. I'll bring my friends with me. And we'll come over and pray for you. And when you come to my house, you see me, and I got my thumb on a table, and I'm beating it with a hammer. And I say, I don't know why. I have such excruciating pain in my thumb. And you say, um, <clears throat> why don't you stop hitting your thumb with a hammer? Okay. And you put your hammer down. Yeah, but it's still throbbing. I'll just go back and you just keep pounding. I wish God would heal me. Well, it's the same thing. So many times people in this world are not healed because of our lifestyle. Now you're looking at me and say, boy, you got a lot to talk about. You're right. I'm as guilty as anyone else. But you know what? The other thing is, in this world that we live in, okay, here comes the conspiracy, but you got to admit, our food is not what it used to be. It's so genetically modified. You know, they make a tomato, and part of it is made out of mouse DNA. You could literally throw it against the wall, and it won't break. And it looks like a tomato, smells like a tomato, and it has zero nutritional value. But it has mouse DNA in it. The big fish that everybody likes now is tilapia. There's no such thing as a tilapia fish swimming around. It's a genetically modified cod, and it's the only fish you can eat that's actually bad for your cholesterol. The food, they're playing with it. So many people all of a sudden now are, you know, they're all oh, gluten-free. I'm, I'm allergic to gluten. Well, bread is the staff of life. Jesus made bread. But the wheat that they grow today is nothing like what it used to be in Jesus' day. The water that we drink is chlorinated and fluoride, just oozing out of it. And the chemtrails in the air and all the other stuff they're fooling around with. We live in an unhealthy society. So that's one reason, people. And also, there's a movie out called The Zapped Generation. And they said each one of us are susceptible to like 10,000 um, chest x-rays a day. Because of the radiation that's all around us from microwaves, from our cell phones, to these cell towers, to all these electrical powers. And we're not made for that. So, yeah, we're, we're living in a different environment. But the other reason that people aren't healed is because I don't know. I don't know. I know that God is always good. He's the God that heals us. He wants us to be healthy. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. That's what God wants for us. But you see, some people are 
blessed with good health. And praise God. Thank God for that. You should be humbled. Other people are not. For what reason? Some because it's self-inflicted. Others just because of whatever other reasons. But what I see happening, and it grieves me, and I used to have to do this when I was in the hyper faith. If I'd go pray for somebody and I prayed for them and they didn't get healed, I had to explain it somehow. So I'd put all the fault on them and I'd say, well, you just don't have enough faith. I heard Kenneth Copeland say in a teaching, he says, when you approach God for healing, you have to pretend like you're standing in front of a vending machine. And in the vending machine, you see the Snickers bar and it's E4 and it costs 50 cents. So if you put the right amount of money in and pull the right lever, that machine has to give you the Snickers bar. And he said, God is the same way. If you approach God with the right amount of faith and you quote the right scriptures, he has to give you what you want. So God works for me? What about a sovereign God who does what he wants and he doesn't have to answer to anybody? God's not a vending machine. I mean, to quote Bob Dylan, he's not an errand boy to satisfy your wandering desires. It's thy will, not my will. But I know God wants me to prosper and be in health, even in conjunction with how my soul prospers through living and obeying his word. But sometimes, even in that case, things happen to people. And when you go up to somebody and say, well, you just don't have enough faith, it's like rubbing salt in an open wound. Now, you may have the best of intentions. I did when I said that to people because, see, I had to have an explanation. I quoted the right scripture, and I have the right amount of faith. I think you do, but then it didn't happen. Well, I guess you didn't have enough faith. And, you know, some people walk around healthy, and instead of being humbled and being blessed, they walk around and, you know, I've known some of these teachers are very arrogant because it's like, see, I got the, I've got the revelation knowledge. I heard Kenneth Copeland say, if the Apostle Paul had the revelation knowledge that I do, he wouldn't have had to go through what he did. Oh, brother. Oh, brother. But you see, to walk around in arrogance and say, see, I have the revelation knowledge. I quote the right scriptures. I have the right amount of faith. It's I, 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 I. It's all about me. Aren't you lucky that you know me? You know what? It's all about Jesus. And there's some things in this life we see through a glass darkly and we don't understand. Many of you know our good friend and our sister, Renee Murdy. A beautiful lady who loved Jesus. The most humble person I've ever met. And she came down with cancer. And we prayed for her constantly for years. And she went through the normal cycle. She went and had surgery. She had chemo. She had radiation. And then she got to the point she said, you know what? I'm not doing this. And she took herself off all those treatments. You know, many times I've seen people, and I'm not making fun of them. or just, I'm just stating it's an interesting observation. So many people say, oh, not me. If I got cancer, I'd never do any of that. I just recently happened to somebody I know. And guess what? They came down with cancer. And they went for chemo and radiation and surgery. When your life's on the line, you have a different point of view. But Renee Murdy said, I'm not doing it. I quit. And she said, I'm believing God's going to heal me. And she did every homeopathic treatment you could think of. I remember me and Bobette were over there once at their house, and we were, you know, trying to cheer her up. And, you know, she, she constantly, she always had a Bible next to her. She was reading scriptures all the time. She had highlighted every scripture that referred to healing. Dave got her a tape recorder. She had the Word of God playing 24 hours a day in her house. And any homeopathic cure you could think of, she would go for it. Like one time we were over there and I was talking to Dave about, I think hemp oil I heard about. It's supposed to be rub it on tumors and they'll go away. And like two minutes later, Dave says, it's done. And I go, what do you mean? Well, we were talking, he ordered it on his cell phone. He said, it'll be here tomorrow. I put a rush on it. Any homeopathic treatment, she did it. And guess what? She died. And was I supposed to say to her, oh, Renee, you just don't have enough faith. 
this woman that was laying in bed moaning, screaming in pain because she took herself off all treatment and she was trusting in God, listening to his word, quoting his scriptures, and doing every homeopathic treatment there was, and she died. And I'm supposed to say, oh, you just don't have enough faith, sister. But guess what? She got healed. And she ain't never going to be sick again. And she's dancing on streets of gold. And if you could talk to her right now, she'd say, I ain't coming back there. You come join me, you ain't going to believe it. So, if we're walking in faith and we're walking in health, then humbly thank your God. But if you have any affliction, are you, are you trusting God? Are you, are you believing in his scriptures? Are you praying to the best of your ability? Are you making sure you're not doing something to sabotage yourself? And if you're doing all those things, like Job ended up by saying, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In conclusion, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. When we're dealing with helping people in sick situations, I can't, I, I've totally lost track years ago how many hospitals and nursing homes I've been in praying with people. And a number of them have been healed. But probably the majority of them were not. But when you go in there, if you go in there with your Bible and a, and a hatchet saying, this is the word of God, you believe it or you're an unfilthy sinner and you don't have enough faith and God's going to kill you. No, that's not the way to do it. You go and you say, Jesus is alive. The kingdom is here. I know he wants you healthy. And that's what we're going to believe in. That's what we're moving on. That's what we're going on. And you don't have to have some magic motion, you know, mo ho hocus pocus. You know, I have the special kind of anointing oil. I anoint people. I've anointed people with vegetable oil from their house. I anointed one person with motor oil in his garage. <laughs> but we've got to be gentle. When people are sick and they're hurting, they're looking for some mercy and some compassion. What did Jesus do when he saw the multitudes? He had compassion on them. Now, if anybody had the right to start wheeling that sword or that word of God and start hacking off arms and legs, it'd be Jesus. But he had compassion, and that's what we should do. And in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him which is the head of all things, even Christ. In love, you accomplish so much more. It says, you know, we, we rejoice with those that rejoice and we mourn with those that mourn. And just have that humble spirit. In the book of Job, and I'll close with this, there was three guys that came to cheer him up or to set him right. And they said, look at Job, come on, let's, let's get honest here. The only reason you're going through all this is because you sinned. Why don't you just confess what sin you did and God will heal you. And Job's saying, yeah, but guys, I didn't do nothing wrong. And even God said in Job 122, in all these things, Job sinned not. God just pulled him out to be an example for all of us, for all history. But these guys kept saying, come on, it's got to be. And they were just saying, you don't have enough faith. You're not quoting enough scripture. you got secret sin in your life. Come on, just confess. And they just beat on him and beat on him. Even his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? And he didn't. He wouldn't. Even Job 122, he did not charge God foolishly. He just endured it. And guess what happened? God said, Job after the discourse where he speaks to him out of the whirlwind, which is some of the most poetic and powerful scripture in existence, is, you know, the last few chapters of the book of Job. But he says, Job, I want you to pray for these three guys that came to comfort you because they're just in their ignorance. And he prayed for them, and that forgiveness saved their lives. And then God restored to Job everything he had, but blessed him twice as much as he did before. So, in the realm of healing, I know everybody has a different point of view, and you may not agree with what Michael Brown said or what I've said, and that's okay. 
But you want people to be healed? I want people to be healed. You want to walk in health? I want to walk in health. But let's just do it in love, the spirit of love and that contention and that fighting with one another. And, oh, you don't believe this, so you're a heathen. No, it just we see things differently. And, you know, I'm not a new kid on the block. I've been doing this for 42 years. And I was, a, I mean, interesting thing, when I was going to go to Rhema Bible Institute, Kenneth Hagin's Bible College to be a pastor, when I got my um, application form, Michael Brown talked about this. Well, this really happened to me. I got my application form, and it said on there, you've got to fill out all the questions. Now, these are people about you speak faith. You just speak things that don't exist. You speak them into existence. But when you answer them, it says, these can't be faith answers. They have to be factual answers. Like, oh, yeah, well, I don't smoke. But you're puffing away three packs a day. But say, oh, I don't smoke. Oh, I don't drink. But you're slamming down the, you know, the whiskey. All day. Oh, but I don't drink. And then when you wrote your check for the application, it said, this can't be faith check. It has to be actual money you have in the bank. Because they would get checks from people, you know, the $300 to apply to the college. People didn't have two nickels to rub together, but they'd write a bad check and say, by faith, I know that God's going to put that money. And they said, we don't want that. So here's the epitome of walking in faith, saying, we want, we want the truth. We don't want all this faith stuff. I had a guy working for me once at Christ Church Cranbrook, and we finally had to fire him because he was so much into the faith movement. His job was to clean a certain part of the building, and he would never clean it. And I said, you know, what's going on? How come you're not cleaning this? And he says, oh, well, I put a rag in the door, and I closed the door, and by faith, angels go and clean that room for me. And I said, well, brother, you better have a long talk with your angel because he's not doing a good job. He's not emptying the trash or dusting. And he says, oh, I do all my work by faith. Yeah, well, the just shall live by faith, but... God said, come, let us reason together. He put a brain in our head. He wants us to use it. So that's my story for right now on healing, and I'm sticking to it. So let's pray, and then we're going to talk about what we're going to do next. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. And I'm so grateful that you're a good God, and you want the best for your people, and we just simply agree with you. So, Lord, I pray for everybody here that you heal us, whatever we're going through. Heal us completely and keep us walking in divine health. And use us, Lord, and give us courage to pray for other people that are going through some physical ailment. And just say, the kingdom is here. And in God's kingdom, there's health, there's joy, there's peace. And when things just don't fit our understanding... Like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Lord, you know how many people I've prayed for, and some have been healed and some haven't, but it's never going to stop me from praying and believing. Lord, thank you for being such a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.